now available on the SIBODoctor.com. The SIBO Success Plan, a course for people with SIBO to help educate and take action. Whether you're working with a practitioner or are battling SIBO out on your own, this course will teach you how to beat SIBO for good. Visit the SIBODoctor.com for more info. Welcome to the SIBO Doctor Podcast with Dr. Narala Jacoby, a US-trained naturopathic physician and medical director of the SIBO Doctor, an online education resource for practitioners. This podcast is intended for SIBO treating practitioners and aims to help educate how we may best serve our SIBO patients. Medical experts join us to discuss functional digestive disorders, clinical practice, and research as it relates to SIBO and associated conditions. Head over to thecebodoctor.com where you can learn everything about SIBO from the basics to advanced treatments. You can also join in the conversation on the SIBO Doctor Practitioner Forum Facebook group. If you're a patient, please note this information is not intended to diagnose or treat medical conditions. Please ask your doctor before initiating any new treatments. We welcome you to head over to the SIBO Lifestyle Facebook group where we post frequent tips and videos to help you on the road to gut health recovery. And now over to Dr. Jacoby and the SIBO Doctor podcast. So welcome SIBO doctor practitioners. I'm here with Dr. Lisa Shaver. I'm actually sitting at her dining room table and it's amazing to be in Portland just about to uh, start the SIBO symposium. And I've had the opportunity, I've been trying to nail her down for for literally years. And so (laughs) I have forced myself onto her basically (laughs) dining room table. And we're here to talk about celiac disease, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and its relationship to SIBO. Yeah. So welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much. I'm so happy that you're here. Welcome Thank you. to Portland. Welcome Thank back. you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you do have a clinic in downtown Portland. You've been in practice for 15 years. Mm-hmm. So what what got you interested in this very specific topic? Because you are a specialist in celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which is a mouthful, definitely. It is. And um, so how did you get into that? You're also a very frequent lecturer or presenter at the different conferences. You're on the summits mm-hmm. and you talk about this frequently and we'll get more um, into some of these other topics that you talk about a little bit later. But so how did you get into it? Yeah, so celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivity are really a a passion of mine. Um, They came really from um, a personal story, as uh, it often does. I um, noticed that I was having issues with what I thought was food sensitivities, and it was my colleagues who pointed out, uh, my, my classmates in medical school, that I would have this cough after eating wheat, and I'd be in a large lecture hall and have this real weird honking cough that people would say, gesundheit, like they weren't quite sure what that was coming out of me. And they said that was always after eating wheat. And so that was on my mind in my second year of medical school, second out of six. And uh, I noticed more and more that I would have certain symptoms when I personally ate wheat. Uh, Met my husband, who's part Italian, and started eating more pasta and more and baking bread. And my symptoms uh, accelerated and exaggerated. So I withdrew it. And then I realized, oh, I want to test myself. So I tested myself as a physician for celiac disease over and over and over and over again while I was eating wheat. And it was always negative. I said, what is this? Because I had symptoms similar to celiac disease as I researched celiac disease. And that really drove me to start fi- trying to figure out everything I can about celiac disease. And then I, it seems like the more I knew about celiac disease, the more patients found me, heard that I was doing this. Um, and at this time, I was seeking more information. So I started attending um, a support group called the Gluten Intolerance Group. And um, of Portland. And then I started managing that group and I've been managing that group for over 10 years. Mm. So um, Mm. it wasn't until 2011 when non-celiac gluten sensitivity was named very recently Mm. that I realized that's why my celiac tests were negative. Mm -hmm. I don't have celiac disease and I don't even have the genes. So I cannot have celiac disease. Right. 
So that's a really perfect segue into understanding or describing what the differences are between celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Absolutely. So celiac disease is a permanent genetic uh, autoimmune disorder where gluten is the trigger that damages the small intestinal lining of um, the digestive tract and it causes inflammation in the um, tissue just under that lining, so on the outside of the small intestine, triggering more inflammation that can go anywhere over the body and cause any myriad of symptoms. The damage to the small intestinal lining also causes uh, a um, inability to digest nutrients, so it causes malnourishment. So you have um, nutrient deficiencies causing a variety of symptoms. So in celiac disease, any symptom that could be from a malabsorption of nutrients or inflammation can be symptoms, which mm -hmm. is every single symptom ever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah. it's really easy. Yeah. It's really easy. <laughs> So if you're, uh, I mean, so that's celiac disease, that's and, celiac and but disease. there's still it's like the prevalence is like what one point five percent or so. So it depends on the research. So mm. um, in general, most of the research has agreed that it's one percent of the population. It doesn't sound like very much, but that makes it very common. Mm. So it's more common than Crohn's disease, um, more common than ulcerative colitis. And uh, more common than lupus and some of these other ones mm -hmm. that, frankly, I would see in my practice much more frequently than a celiac would come in my practice. Mm. So to me, it's my goal is to get physicians diagnosing more frequently and running tests more frequently on patients. Okay. So are the tests, besides the gene markers which are negative in those that have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, but they're positive in CD or celiac disease. So is that the only difference in terms of tests? So interestingly enough, so here's the deal with genes. So 95% of celiacs have the genes for celiac disease. The general population, about 30% of the general population have the gene. 30% of the general population mm. have the gene, but only one develop celiac disease, hmm. 1% of the population. That's interesting. However, in non-celiac gluten sensitivity, 40% of us have the genes. Oh. <laughs> I know. So what is going on? It's not pre-celiac disease. That's been hmm. ruled out because we don't have any damage in the small intestine. Mm -hmm. So non-celiac gluten sensitivity is both an innate and an adaptive response to gluten It does not have damage, and it is not autoimmune as far as we know. However, research shows people with non-celiac gluten sensitivity have a higher rate of autoimmune disease than mm. the average person out there. The average person out there, I don't really remember, it's something, it's like under 10%. Mm. And in non-celiacs, it's something like 25%. So it's mm. 2.5 times. That's huge. It's greatly increased in non celiac gluten sensitivity, mm. but we haven't found a gene and we don't really know the cause. Mm. We just know you ingest gluten, you feel bad. You take it out, you feel better. Mm. You ingest gluten, you feel bad. So that's the conventional way mm. to test for non celiac gluten sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So, so just getting back to celiac disease, it doesn't have this innate and adaptive response from the immune system, or is it just so that, so you have the damage that is done by what? Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. actually the gluten molecule. So gluten mm -hmm. is actually a very large, very mm -hmm. difficult to digest molecule anyway, difficult for everybody to digest anyway. And, um, Thing. It does mm. damage by interacting with certain um, chemicals that we make, certain markers we make mm. right at the base of the cells that um, line the small intestine, which are tissue transglutaminase mm -hmm. and then another one called deaminated gliadin peptide. That's mm. where 
the damage is started, and those are the two markers that we use. So as the gluten goes by the cells and into the cells and it goes into the tissue below the cells that line the small intestine, that's where the damage starts. And then there's all, there's this whole mm-hmm. cascade of inflammation. Mm-hmm. So we thought it ended there. And unfortunately, there's a very new, to me, very important piece of research that just came out in February that said in celiacs, Unfortunately, there are cells right there under the small intestinal lining that permanently switch to pro-inflammatory cells. Mm. Mm -hmm. So in celiacs, they have inflammation constantly, whether they're on a 100% gluten-free diet or Mm. not. Is that like the innate, like, you know, like with mold sensitivity, how people have SIRS or chronic inflammatory response syndrome, which is just an, an, an innate immune response that can't be switched off. Yeah, we don't know. I mean, it has yeah. to do with the T cells. And mm. I want to see more research on this. Mm. I want to read mm. more on this. But that that's huge to me mm. in the celiac disease uh, world. One, because we know celiacs have an increased rate of mortality just by being a celiac. Mm. Just by being a celiac, you're going to have a shorter life. Just by being a celiac, you have an increased rate of death from all causes. Just by being a celiac, you have increased rate of most cancers except for breast cancer. So mm. I celebrate that. You have to celebrate something. <laughs> the wins. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And by being a celiac, you have an increased rate of, uh, of gathering and collecting other autoimmune diseases. hmm mm-hmm. And the sooner we diagnose celiac disease, the less autoimmune diseases you gather, starting right. at like two years old. Mm-hmm. Okay. So something like between two and four, you have, uh, I'm going to make this up, maybe like a 4% chance. And then by the time you're like 18, you have like a 20% chance of gathering other mm. autoimmune. And it just increases as you age. So that's that's uh, one reason to really catch these kids early. Oh, we have to test, test, yeah. test. So let's kind of just so that I can wrap my head around it a little bit more. And I'm sure other practitioners have a similar question about the testing, right? It's really confusing. It is confusing. So we, okay. So if we're saying that they're essentially two different diseases because you're ending up, but it's the same trigger, right? It's the gluten that's triggering both diseases and they're very different. One causes damage and loss of crypts and all of the rest of it in your, in your digestive tract. And the other one causes what sounds like just an activated immune system. Right. 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 So is there any overlap at all in terms of what we're looking for? Do, would, would, for example, deaminated gliadin be positive in the non-celiac gluten sensitivity? No, it's not. Right. Neither is tissue transglutaminase. And that's why this, um, a group of international gastroenterologists got together in London in 2011, early 2011, and said, what is the deal? These people are worse on gluten. We take them off, they get better. We put them on, they get worse. We take them off, they get better. But they're not testing positive to Mm -hmm. tissue transglutaminase. Mm -hmm. But this lab test called anti-gliadin antibody is positive. And that is the test for non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Okay. Now, unfortunately, just a couple years after this 2011 announcement, so fast forward into the fall at the International Celiac Disease Symposium in Oslo, they said, we have a new disease. It's called non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Unfortunately, science had, at the parallel time, were developing a more sensitive test for celiac disease than this anti-gliadin antibody, and they removed... AGA, anti-gliadin mm. antibody, from lab test availability and replaced it with deaminated gliadin peptide. Mm. So we don't conventionally have that AGA to test for non celiac gluten sensitivity anymore. Any oh. national lab doesn't offer that anymore because it was mm. replaced by a mm-hmm. more specific celiac disease called DGP. Mm-hmm. Now, that being said, some people might think, wait a second, I just saw that in my lab test option. Mm -hmm. Labs know that physicians were used to seeing AGA. So they still call Mm. the new DGP by the old AGA name, Mm -hmm. but it's not AGA. It's not AGA. It's so confusing. But that's the only marker 
that we use to differentiate between, or to, or to say, if that's positive, you have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Yeah, IgA plus mm. IgG. Okay. So both of those. So mm. there's two of those. However, research has also shown that there are other markers other than gluten, sorry, other proteins in wheat mm. other than gluten. So gluten makes up about 70% of all of the protein in a wheat grain, in a wheat kernel. Um, but what about that other 30%? What is, what's mm. in there? So there are proteins like saponins and ferronins and ATIs, amylase, trypsin inhibitors, and uh, a host of others. And uh, there are now lab tests in specialty labs or functional medicine labs or out-of-network labs that can test for these, both IgA and IgG. Hmm. Also, there are um, um, <coughs> tissue transglutaminase and, um, and deamidated gliadin peptide complexes, more leaning towards celiac disease. There are also wheat germ tests, hmm. IgA and IgG. That could be either. Hmm. So there are these functional medicine tests that test, I don't know, maybe 25, 30 tests. Is that the Cyrex test? Uh, or uh, the Wheat Zoomer by Vibrant Wellness out of oh, California. Oh, great. That's good to know. Yeah. yeah. We're sort of limited in Australia with what we have, but those listening from America, ask your functional doctor about those um, tests possibly. Yeah. What well, you haven't mentioned zonulin. Where does that fit in? Right. So... Um, there are three things that must be present in order celiac disease to happen. Gluten must be being ingested. So if somebody's on a gluten-free diet, you can't test this person, and celiac disease process will be somewhat slowed. So gluten has to be present. Uh, they have to have the genes. There is that weird 5% of celiacs, but in general, they have to have the genes. And then leaky gut must be present. Mm. So I can't tell you how many times I've talked to patients, when did you start exhibiting these new celiac disease symptoms? Once we diagnose them and their migraines go away or their bone pain goes away or their rash goes away or their horrific non-manageable uh, PMS or menopausal symptoms or their... Um, uh, prostatitis or, you know, mm. all, any symptom, any system of the body can be affected. And of course, the GI, mm. bloating, burping, mm. reflux, gas, diarrhea, constipation. Sounds like SIBO. Could be SIBO. Um, and they often say it was after I had a car accident mm. or it was after I had surgery or it was after a horrible divorce mm. or it was after I found my partner cheating on me. Or it was after I was managing my kids and my mom in a nursing home. You know, it was these long periods of stress leading to leaky gut. Um, after mm -hmm. I started a new medication, after I was on a, an NSAID for my injury, and then, you know, it, it started. Mm. Massive so stressors leaky gut, are big. Leaky big gut, mm -hmm. yeah. So leaky gut has to be there. So, mm -hmm. um they're on the Wheat Zoomer panel by Vibrant mm. Wellness. Mm. A leaky gut panel is there mm. with actin, myosin, and um, zonulin. Nice. Very nice. Mm. So you're testing for celiac disease, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, wheat allergy, which is also important to um, rule out, and then leaky gut. It's a fantastic panel. Mm. No affiliation. No. But Sadly. I, yeah. But <laughs> I found it about a year ago mm. and and um You've been getting good results with that. I've been like getting great results. Okay. Yeah. Clinically, right. I've been getting great results. Okay. What would you say to because I've had um a few kids in my practice that tested positive for the genes, mm -hmm. but zero on the markers. Right. So we have to make sure that they're eating the equivalent of a piece of bread to four pieces of bread, the equivalent, daily for four weeks to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. There's one piece of research that says two weeks, but I just don't believe that. Mm -hmm. The antibodies can rise for two weeks and they start going down after two weeks. So they start to rise in the first two weeks. So 
I say if a person can tolerate it to eat that gluten daily for four to eight weeks. So if that person was kind of sort of occasionally eating gluten and the markers were negative, it might be that they that we missed it. Yeah. Also, the conventional lab tests. So that would be tissue transglutaminase, IgA, tissue transglutaminase, IgG, deaminated gliadin peptide, IgA, deaminated gliadin peptide, IgG, and then total mm. IgA. So those are the mm-hmm. five tests we have to run. If you don't, you can miss you can miss celiac disease. Typically, a practitioner only runs TTG IgA, tissue transglutaminase IgA, and that's it. Mm. And if that's positive, great, you do have celiac disease. But if it's negative, then there's sort of this algorithm that you might use one or the other of these other tests. And I just think that's really inaccurate. Mm-hmm. I I have heard researchers postulate that maybe we're catching 50% of the celiacs with a conventional lab test. So to me, I tell my patients, if it's positive, it's a true positive. If the test comes back negative, we don't find anything, it might be a false negative, and we have to run one of these panels. Mm -hmm. Whether the uh, Cyrex wheat and gluten proteome or um, the uh, Vibrant Wellness um, The wheat wheat sumer. Okay. Yeah, because right. I think we're missing it. Yeah, I think we're missing. Because I just yeah, I had a few. The, they can have the genes and yeah. not have celiac disease. Because well, I mean, they were very symptomatic. Well, you know right. what I mean? And I right. think what um, then when we tested the labs, uh, it was uh, negative, negative right. uh, ser- serum markers. Uh, but I think I underdosed what they were supposed to eat because yeah. it was just so horrible for them right. when they would eat wheat. And that's the problem. As a physician, I. My job is to do no harm. Mm-hmm. And yet I tell them, you need to go back on wheat and eat that daily. And if they're a celiac, that could really do damage to eat, to eat, mm. to have, if they have removed it, if they are eating a gluten-free or a relatively gluten-free diet, the body becomes hypervigilant. The immune mm. system becomes hypervigilant to wheat and they can have a worse reaction going back on wheat. So mm. I really have to have that discussion. It's a long discussion with my patients, the pros and cons of actually getting a celiac disease diagnosis. Mm-hmm. That being said, um, there is a stool panel that is possible uh, by Dr. Kenneth Fine out of Texas. It's called Intero Lab. Mm. And he has said that he has found elevated antibodies in a stool sample a full year after the last time somebody ate gluten. Whoa. So it's a that different would be compartment. Useful. Mm. There's a blood compartment and there's a GI compartment, and they're very different. And it would be TTG. Yes, yeah, it's tissue transcontaminase. Okay. So um, he recommends that people eat wheat. Mm. But if somebody comes into me and they say, I will never put wheat in my mouth intentionally again, our options are limited. I can say, well, we can try to run a panel and see if we can catch something. Because if the... If the lab antibodies were super, super, super high and it's been a few months, they might still be coming down Mm -hmm. because you can test a celiac and maybe their lab markers are in the hundreds or thousands. And then in six months, they're down in the lower hundreds or the Mm -hmm. high hundred, you know, Mm -hmm. and then in in a year, they'll be gone. Yeah. So you might catch somebody even though they haven't been eating. But if it's been years. Yeah and they refuse to eat gluten, your options are limited. Mm -hmm. You can run a genetic panel, and Mm -hmm. then you know they're within the possibility, Mm -hmm. but it's not very specific. Mm -hmm. So, you know, before we started recording, we were talking about sort of a little bit going down the ethical road of just basically saying, okay, well, you feel better without wheat. You should just stay on a gluten-free diet or even start out your children that way. What are the potential caveats to that? So um, in the United States, gluten free, eating gluten-free became a fad. And a lot of people went off gluten or sort of went off gluten, and a lot of people felt better. And unfortunately, in the United States, we're doing a really abysmal job of diagnosing celiacs. We've only found about 15% of all of the celiacs who've been, uh, who are in the United States. So only 15%, which is a ridiculously low diagnosis rate. So there are people wandering around either on a gluten-free diet or a low gluten-free diet. So to me, a gluten-free diet means zero gluten. 
you only eat at gluten-free restaurants, 100% gluten-free restaurants, and you cook 100% gluten-free at home. You never intentionally eat gluten or what we call cheat, and and uh, you don't expose yourself. So um, that's there, also the medications and things like you know certain things have gluten in it. You can't toast your toast in the same toaster oven, as people. Yeah. Cast iron pan has to be thrown out. And oh replaced. wow! Yeah, it's porous. Cast iron is porous. Oh, wow. Teflon can get scratches and gluten mm. can get under there. Plastic cutting boards, plastic utensils, scratch little spatulas. I didn't even think of it. Wooden cutting boards, wooden stirring spoons. Yeah, I had a stirring spoon from a dear neighbor who was elderly and passed away. And the family said, do you want anything of hers? And I got her wooden stirring spoon that was like almost diagonal at one point because <laughs> she had used it for so many years. And I Aww. loved it so much. And I wow. gave it away, but it was, it meant mm, like, yeah. not my wooden story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, dear. these little things that have yeah. such sentimental value. Yeah. But, um, yeah, you had to replace all that. Wow. 100%. 100%. And that 100%. is, um, so, so practitioners, uh, that was, you know, Dr. Shaver has given a few times this lecture on ethical, the ethics of prescribing a gluten-free diet. And this is beyond totally going into this now, but um, we will have more information about where to find yeah. it possibly and, and all that. Cause I think it's a really important topic for practitioners because you can, so what happens if the idea here is that if you tell people to observe this diet forever, they're unlikely to do it anyways, or you have, so people who have a diagnosis of celiac disease are more likely mm. to follow a gluten zero diet. And that term gluten zero, I didn't coin. That's Dr. Mm. Rodney Ford out of Christchurch, uh, New Zealand. I'm going to cry because of what happened in Christchurch recently, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but, um, he's a pediatric gastroenterologist and, um, allergist. And he termed uh, he coined the term gluten zero and it makes sense because mm. you can go into the restaurant that has, uh, they make their own bread and they have pasta, regular pasta. And there's all this flour all over and like, Oh, would you like to see our gluten-free menu? It's not, it's mm. a low gluten menu. So there's a lot of people out there eating low gluten and they think they're eating quote gluten-free when really they need to be a gluten zero diet. So people diagnosed with celiac disease tend to eat a true gluten zero diet But people who have figured out that gluten is bad for them, about 49% of them don't adhere to a gluten-free diet. Mm. And those could be celiacs doing constant and chronic yeah. damage. Because in celiac disease, you have four classifications. You have classic celiac disease, the digestive tract issues, the diarrhea, the wasting, the nutrient, the, uh, nutrient deficiencies. Then you have atypical symptoms. That's your neurological symptoms. Those are your cardiac symptoms. Those are your pulmonary symptoms. And then you have latent celiac disease. So that means their markers are positive, but they haven't had an a endoscopy with a biopsy. The tissue has not shown damage yet. And that basically means you have celiac disease, keep eating gluten, and eventually your intestines will be damaged and we'll be able to find it on biopsy. And then there's this really interesting category called silent celiac disease. You feel no symptoms, mm -hmm. but you have markers in blood and you have a positive biopsy. Your intestines mm -hmm. are damaged, but you don't have any symptoms. But the signs could be osteoporosis, right? Mm -hmm. You can't absorb your calcium, magnesium, boron, et cetera, strontium, et cetera, or chronically low iron which mm. we also see in SIBO. Yeah. So someone presents to you with their only symptom is chronically low iron. You're like, oh, those SIBO buggers love to eat up iron. Mm. Maybe it's SIBO and you jump to SIBO, you might be missing a celiac disease diagnosis. Elevated liver enzymes too. You know, oh, you're drinking too much alcohol, but mm. it's not, it has to do with alcohol mm. at all. It just has to do with uh, celiac and the celiac disease inflammation. Mm. So there's a whole host short stature especially in kids. They're just short because they're malnourished, but that's the only symptom, sign, mm -hmm. not really a symptom, they don't feel it, that they're mm -hmm. showing. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we have to diagnose. Yeah. We have to diagnose. Fascinating. Thank you for listening to the SIBO Doctor Podcast. 
We hope you found the information in this episode useful in the treatment of your SIBO patients. Thanks to our sponsors, SIBOtest.com, a breath testing service with easy online ordering, and Quintron, maker of outstanding breath testing equipment. Tune in again for another episode of the SIBO Doctor podcast. Thanks again for listening.